Well, thank you all for being here tonight, and thank you, Margaret, for that um, lovely introduction. Um, I know we're running a little bit late, so I'm going to put my watch here where I can hopefully uh, catch us up with some of our time. Um, I need to begin by thanking a few people myself. My assistant at the Albright Knox, Caroline Gerwitz, uh, who helped coordinate this presentation and who was also the curatorial assistant for the exhibition I did at the Albright Knox last year. Um, I would not be standing here were it not for her. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Tim Clifford and Emmy Salamacaro of the Robert Indiana Catalog Raisonne Project, uh, who've always shared wonderfully the information they have, some of it quite recently with me. Uh, Mark Salamacaro for suggesting that I might be somebody that you'd like to hear from tonight or might have something worthwhile to say. Um, and also Mark and Emmy's father, Simon Salamacaro, who for 30 years has been the most important exponent uh, uh, and promoter of the work of Robert Indiana and has really shepherded his legacy to what it has become today. So thank you. And thank you also, Margaret and Marcel, for having me here. Um, Aaron, thank you for shepherd me, shepherding me around, and also Ted in the booth. Thank you. I hope not to have to call on your services. Robert Indiana's American Love. The purpose of my talk this evening is simple. I want to share the richness and breadth of the Robert Indiana I've come to know and appreciate over the past five years and to tell you why the work and acquisition we have gathered to celebrate today is special, for it certainly is. Among the variety of love sculptures Indiana produced over some four decades, only one bears such a rich, richly individuated title, and that is the American love. But there is much, much more that contributes to the importance of the American love in Indiana's career. An array of bio biographical material and varied artistic production that challenges the simple purpose I've stated for this talk. I'll show you what I mean over the next 45, maybe 40 minutes or so. The life and work of Indiana is an absolutely fascinating, circuitous journey of discovery. And by the end of our time together, I hope you'll appreciate your American love as an important, richly layered masterpiece by this quintessentially American artist. In fact, in his own mind, the American love is likely the most quintessential expression of Robert Indiana's artistic identity, but we will circle back to that. Let's begin far away from the American love, or so it might seem. Frequent visitors to this museum might have come across the early sculpture that Margaret referred to, M. What Indiana referred to as a herm, following the nomenclature of an ancient Greek form and produced several years before he conceived his first love sculpture. M is among Indiana's earliest herms and includes the orb imagery the artist was working with in paintings of the previous year. These are among Indiana's first works as a mature artist. And I should just make a note here about the dating. Uh, Indiana went back to this painting completed in 1959 in gouache, similar to this uh, white here, and painted it over with gold uh, at, a, at a later date, that, it, that being 2001. Art historians call this sculpture, M, an assemblage because it's made of found materials. A wooden beam from a building demolished in his lower Manhattan neighborhood, an old iron wheel and a wooden peg that the artist assembled into this form and painted over. Herms like this are where Indiana's sculptural practice begins. This sculpture has been in the museum's collection since 1982 when it was donated by Mr. and Mrs. Marvin Fishman. We at the Albright Knox have one of these herms in our collection as well. Indiana worked on it from 1960 to 62. It's called Star, and it was acquired by the Albright Knox in 1963. How many of you have seen the sculpture at left? How many of you recognize this sculpture? Let me see a, a strong show of hands, please. 
Now, how many of you knew this image at Wright, or one quite like it, prior to hearing about all of this hullabaloo about having it here in Milwaukee? <laughs> Astonishing. My own, now, uh, my own journey of discovery began from a point not too far from yours. Virtually everyone knows love, even if they've never heard of Robert Indiana. So ubiquitous and memorable is this iconic image that it's hard to see it with fresh eyes. A love is a love is a love, we might think. But all of us know from personal experience that one love is never precisely like another. <laughs> Our individual varied experiences of love itself is surely one reason Indiana's love became such a phenomenon once it was introduced to the world in the mid-1960s and continues to woo us today. Not only was it the first time a word became a sculpture, it was a word to which everyone on the face of the earth could relate individually, privately. But as a work of public sculpture, such as installed here in Milwaukee, these individual associations may coalesce into more collective sensibility. Now, I love this. I love seeing people love their loves. It warms my heart. But let me just suggest that the collective sensibility of Milwaukee not include climbing on your love. <laughs> the love sculpture is a self-contained statement that leaves viewers to fill in the part of speech. Does it mean to be a noun or a verb? A gentle observation or a call to action? As well as punctuation, do you think of a question mark, an exclamation point? or perhaps an ellipsis of reverie. The accrual of personal associations makes the public love sculpture a site for communal reflection, if one and many are willing, upon our collective socio-political consciousness and conscience. What does American love mean to us individually and collectively with respect to one another today? Indiana would implore us to think about that, but I'm getting ahead of myself. As I said, my Indiana journey began, like yours, with an overabundance of familiarity with love that obscured any deeper awareness or understanding of Robert Indiana and his wider body of work. Love essentially displaced its maker and everything else he made, a phenomenon that has defined our awareness of Indiana's art now for many decades. One day at the Albright Knox, where I arrived in 2013, right around the time of the Whitney Museum of American Arts comprehensive Robert Indiana retrospective, our work star caught my attention. What did this work mean? How and why did the artist get from star to love in the span of less than five years? And did anything more ever come of early works like M star, and a dozen or so of their siblings made prior to love. Was love really the end point of Indiana's sculptural work after his early adventures in wood and steel, or was there more? The Whitney's exhibition Beyond Love was, quite astonishingly, the first museum exhibition ever devoted to Indiana in New York City. New York City was where the Indiana-born artist Robert Clark moved in 1954, self-consciously rechristened himself after his home state at the launch of his career in 1958, and would live for near 25 years before his permanent departure for Vinyl Haven, Maine in 1978. By the time of his departure, the ubiquity of love through its unauthorized commercial exploitation had put a dent in Indiana's reputation. But other factors were critical to his departure. The closure of the New York City branch of the Paris-based Denis René Gallery that represented his work, as well as the loss of his leaf, lease on the five-floor Soho building where he had lived, worked, and progressively expanded since 1965. 
In any event, for the remainder of his increasingly reclusive life, Indiana lived on the island of Vinyl Haven, Maine, in a 1881 Victorian lodge called the Star of Hope. The return of Indiana's work to New York City and widespread critical attention through the Whitney's exhibition in 2013 was a long, long overdue homecoming. But still, the question Star posed to me and that the inscrutable M may have posed over the years to those few of you who recognize it, still remained. What are we to make of these works that seem so different from love, which was conceived only a few years later, and whatever became of them? Let me answer that question directly before returning to your love. First, the early wood assemblages, the Herms like Star M and more than a dozen others, were not the last works of their kind. Indiana returned to these sculptural forms of 1960 to 62 in the early to mid 1980s while resident on Vinyl Haven. This return, tentative at first, was invigorated by an exhibition in 1984 mounted by the National Museum of American Art part of the Smithsonian that is now called the Smithsonian American Art Museum. Woodworks, construction by Robert Indiana, was the first time Indiana's herms were collected together for an exhibition. At the time of that exhibition, Indiana completed a sculpture entitled Five, which the artist gifted to the museum to complement a 1963 painting, one of a series which you'll see more of momentarily, that had long been in the National Museum's possession and that it formally acquired in 1984. As Indiana said in a lecture on the occasion of the Smithsonian Exhibition's opening, I am very pleased that the museum has acquired the painting that has been here for so many years. It is receiving something that very early on I thought of doing. It was my intention that each one of my major paintings would have a sculpture companion. And now, for the first time, the National Museum here will be having that shown because in no other place did my sculpture end up where the painting ended up. As Indian Anna himself stated at this time, the Smithsonian exhibition sparked renewed interest in the wooden forms with which his career as a sculptor had begun. By 2000, more than two dozen new wood sculptures would be completed, some diminutive and some on monumental scale, such as Mars and KVF, which you see here. Subsequent to their completion, Indiana selected a number of the larger works from this later production to cast in bronze. Produced in a foundry called Kunstgießerei in St. Gallen, Switzerland, these remarkable works are among the most complicated bronze sculptures fabricated in the contemporary era. And here you see a wood on the left and a bronze on the right. And uh, this is just to say that um, everything that you see, the wood, the rusted uh, steel, uh, everything is made of bronze. The pitchfork at the top, these are really truly extraordinary works. This casting project of monumental woods produced in Indiana's later years recapitulates an earlier casting project of the late 1980s and early 1990s in which eight of his early herms that still remained with him were translated into bronze. Here I'm showing you an installation shot from the sculpture retrospective last summer um, where you have USA, a work entitled USA, appearing in uh, both bronze and wood. With each of these casting projects, it's difficult to distinguish between the wooden assemblage and its bronze doppelganger, and this makes for some curatorial fun uh, when you want to put two things that appear to be the same thing right next to each other um, and next to their pendant painting. The late wood sculptures and their bronze counterparts were unknown to American audiences prior to their installation at the Albright Knox last summer. 
And the earlier ones, such as the Ahab bronze and wood that you see here, um, were little better known. The American Love Sculpture, and here I'm showing you a six-foot version installed on the High Line in New York, as opposed to the 12-foot version in that pastoral setting that I have been showing you before. Yours is an eight-foot. You're not going to see that until later. <laughs> this was not included in the Albright Knox exhibition because the only love sculptures exhibited inside the museum were yet another body of late works that had never been seen. The Marble Loves completed between 2001 and 2014. Made from stones selected by the artist, these extraordinary works were crafted by craftsmen, uh, excuse me, carved by craftsmen in Pietra Santa, Italy, near the historic marble quarries of Carrara, and they add a new dimension to our understanding of the love sculptures as a body of work. They are exquisitely beautiful, um, ranging from malachite and travertine to more traditional white marble, Carrara marble. Robert Indiana, a sculpture retrospective, included considerably more two-dimensional works, paintings, prints, and drawings, than a viewer or curator might reasonably expect in a sculpture show. This was because in the magical and mercurial mind and memory of Indiana, different media and materials and even moments in his career carry meaning in different ways. Further, one discovers that themes in Indiana's work repeat themselves not only across these different media, painting and sculpture, for example, but also, or materials, wood and bronze or polychromed aluminum, but also across time, often traversing many decades. As one delves into the artist's work across the 50-year arc of his career, what is most astonishing is that virtually every artistic choice, a number, a color, a word, a geometric shape, carries a meaning that evolves and accrues additional significance and associations with the passage of time. These meanings and significations remain hidden when different bodies of work are considered as discrete groups. The numbers, paintings, and later sculptures, the numerically inspired decade auto portraits that document the years and events of Indiana's life, the Hartley elegies, a magisterial suite of 18 paintings from 1984 to 1989, and their pendant sculptures Mars and KVF, which memorialize the relationship between American modernist painter Marsden Hartley and his friend and lover, the German officer Karl von Freiburg, who was killed in the opening days of World War I. If these works are unknown to you, this is perhaps indicative of the fact that Robert Indiana, long synonymous with love, if recognized at all beyond the art world, is a much more varied and fascinating artist than the masterpiece creation with which we are all too familiar might suggest. For Indiana, however, meaning is made across these varied bodies of work and different periods. To be more specific, we risk losing the individuality of works such as the early Herms when they are set apart from other bodies of work in Indiana's practice. These objects benefit from close association with their thematic counterparts in other media and from other periods to fully resonate. Meteor of 2000, which I show you here, a diminutive late woodwork, for example, harkens back to the Albright Knox Art Gallery's Year of Meteors of 1961 and achieves greater resonance with this early painting than with a contemporaneous monumental sculpture such as A Life on Vinyl Haven. Similarly, the number two, part of the numbers one through zero series, which Indiana conceived as a life cycle from birth to death, is, after 1965, always presented in blue and green when given a specific color. 
This color combination resonates with autobiographical associations in the few blue and green paintings Indiana made, such as Year of Meteors, here on the left, or Leaves of 1965, here at right, which was completed when Indiana leaves the life he had known at his Cointe Slip studio in Lower Manhattan when his own building is slated for demolition. Of the number two, Indiana stated, I'm particularly interested in two because it takes a couple to make love. Two is just my own personal number. It does require two for love, and love has been my greatest preoccupation. Or take the red and yellow of the number four, which he called the most raucous and unruly color combination. Indiana associated four with adolescence and perhaps with sexual awakening. And of it, he wrote, the most troublesome of the suite of numbers, that is, beginning with the difficulty of fitting the awkward angular number into the circular format in the original painting, typical of that period in life. Now witness the body of early work flesh, fleshed out in these raucous and unruly colors. Whole, which calls attention to its namesake in contrast to the red-tipped phallic protrusion below. Or mate, in which one wheel is positioned atop the other and circles of numbers meet in opposite, direction, in opposite directions beneath them again with a phallic peg below, to which the red arrow winkingly calls your attention in case you missed it. <laughs> One might ask, is mate here meant to be a verb or a noun? And the sweet mystery, which features identical yellow forms derived from ginkgo leaves. He lived across this, uh, a park that had a bunch of ginkgo trees was across the street on Coenty Slip. And these ginkgo leaves uh, are identical to one another. These ginkgo leaves are framed by caution stripes, which you also see here on Mate and in other works of that period. The inspirations for the work's title was most likely an early 20th century song in which the sweet mystery of life is defined as love. Once one understands the references and the context, the image resonates an express, as an expression of the anxiety surrounding same-sex love at that moment in time. All of this is to suggest that once they become codified over the course of Indiana's artistic development, a number, a color, or a combination, a word, a shape, a theme, they all mean something specific and they are all there for us to see if we know how to crack the code, so to speak. Let me make this more clear with an example that moves us closer to our particular subject matter. I previously mentioned the decade auto portraits, which are abstract, conceptual, and retrospective reflections in the guise of self-portraiture. The auto portrait for 1965 is red, white, and blue. Washington, D.C was an important site of activity for the artists that year. For the 29th Biennial Exhibition of Contemporary American Painting, which opened in February at the Corcoran Gallery of Art, a full room was devoted to Indiana's paintings. In June, Indiana attended the White House Festival of the Arts, a celebration of visual art, music, and poetry conceived to highlight the importance of the arts in the United States. This festival was part of the push to establish the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities, uh, which became, were signed into law and became a reality in September of 1965. Indiana's work was represented in a group exhibition there and was subsequently transferred, that exhibition was subsequently transferred to the National Gallery of Art. In September of 1965, the figure five painting you've previously seen was hung in the, old Senate, in, in the old Senate office building as part of an exhibition to honor the Indiana State Arts Commission and the state's sequicentennial. At the end of the exhibition, Indiana's five painting was hung in the White House, the home of the commander in chief, 
for the next few years. Indiana moved to number two Spring Street in June of 1965. And again, the painting commemorates 65, 1965, and the Decade series was begun in 1972. Let's look at it with another auto portrait so we can see the compositional re uh, regularity. Here is the Decade auto portrait for 1961. Both paintings feature a circle, that's pretty obvious, for Indiana, a symbol of eternity and cyclicality. That circle inscribes a decagon, which is a 10-sided figure, okay? And that represents the years of the decade. A large star is at the center of every one of these six-foot square decade auto portraits. That is a symbol for Indiana himself. In fact, a star inside of a circle is the symbol Indiana had used to represent his first gallery exhibition in 1962. The giant one that runs from top to bottom and left to right of the canvas is also a symbol of the artist. Each of us is one, an individual. One is where things begin before the love of two. The smaller number at the center, the one here, the five here, is representative of the year of the decade the painting documents. So these are symbolic portraits that are like diary entries of what's important retrospectively in the artist's life. 1961 was a momentous year in Indiana's life because this was the year Alfred Barr, albeit spelled with two R's, purchased Indiana's The American Dream painting of the same year his first to enter a museum. That painting was the first in what would ultimately become a series of nine American Dream paintings, the last of which was completed only in 2001, 40 years after the first. The dark nine panel diamond-shaped painting presents a selective retrospective of sorts of the artist's previous output. The greatest of the American Dream paintings is a 15-foot tall, five-panel work of 1963, The Fifth American Dream. This is the first time Indiana, who several times toyed with the idea of becoming a poet, boils down the essence of his experience to four three-letter words, eat, hug, air, and die, which together defined the American dream theme for Indiana. And this five-panel painting is one of the series of five paintings of the number five to which the Smithsonian's five work belongs. As you will recall, the Smithsonian's painting has its own pendant sculpture, but the sculptural pendant to the American dream series as a whole might be this later work of 1992. And here you see the wood version at left and the bronze version, the painted bronze version at right. It looks very much like a sculpture from the early 1960s. This is his only sculpture entitled The American Dream. And as I mentioned, it was one he chose to cast in bronze. However, there is a further substantial installation work on this theme, the Electric American Dream, conceived in 2000 and among the very last works completed in Indiana's lifetime. I'm sorry, conceived in 2007. This work harkens back to Indiana's first public sculpture, a monumental electrified eat sign that graced the exterior of the New York State Pavilion of the 1964 New York World's Fair. And incidentally, or one might rather say quite purposefully, the only love work Indiana electrified was an American love. While love would be Indiana's greatest preoccupation and is certainly his best known work, 
The American dream is, in fact, the most important and abiding overarching theme in Indiana's work. It's the one that organizes and collects the breadth of his full practice. As a point of origin, that is his first work, collected by a museum, and, as life would have it, a final statement, the electric American dream. Because of the prevalence of love in our collective imagination and the importance of the American dream in Indiana's work, last year's sculpture retrospective at the Albright Knox began with the American dream sculpture alongside the number zero, which is always represented in shades of gray at the end of the number series in commemoration of the artist's passing shortly before the exhibition opened. Poise midway, though, between his greatest preoccupation, love, and his most important underlying theme, the American dream, is a specific work that connects this chain of associations, and that is the American love. Indiana's life and work, I'm hoping you understand, unfolds as a series of overlapping thematic interests, an autobiographical Venn diagram of sorts, and the American love is quite close to its center. This alone would make it among his most important works, just as one herm or one number is meaningly different from another, so with the loves. But what is most significant and potentially most instructive for us is the passion and commitment with which Robert Indiana lived his identity as an American artist and simply as an American. For the remainder of this talk, I'll focus specifically on that American theme so you may better understand the character of the man. And along the way, I'll show you the story of love's development. After Indiana's work was acquired by Mr. Barr, MoMA sent out a questionnaire to the artist asking him about his work. And keep in mind, at that point, he'd never yet had a commercial gallery exhibition. But this is his confident reply. I propose to be an American painter, not an internationalist speaking some glib visual Esperanto. Possibly I intend to be a Yankee. I am an American painter of signs charting the course. I would be a people's painter as well as a painter's painter. I feel that I am at the front of a wave, not over dense with fish. Hmm. One might be glad that he didn't become a poet at that <laughs> unusual statement. But one can see what Indiana means in the transformation that takes place between the orb painting of 1959 at left with a refined proto-minimalist vocabulary and the American sweetheart at right, which offers a more declarative rock and roll pinball machine kind of aesthetic. Later in the fall of 1961, he takes up a series of paintings on the theme of American industry, which he would pursue over the next couple of years. These have a critical edge in keeping with the American dream theme. These visually dazzling works critique the optimistic narrative of American consumerism and industry during the post-war years. At this time, he also begins a series of large-scale paintings that are his most ambitious text-based works to date, The Calumet, Year of Meteors, and The Melville Triptych. Referred to by Indiana as his literary paintings, the canvases incorporate quotes from the 19th century American authors Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, here for the Calumet, Walt Whitman, a reference to Leaves of Grass, and Herman Melville, obviously, Moby Dick. And that's why the sculptural pendant is called Ahab. Importantly, these authors we recognize as great figures of American literature today were not appreciated as such at the time, as America was still very much under the sway of European culture. 
But Indiana was determined to be an American painter and committed to American sources. What these authors had in common, at least amongst those in the know, however, is that they were all gay. Indiana is not only precociously assembling a uniquely American literary canon as a wellspring of inspiration, but also simultaneously identifying as a gay artist through coded reference at a time when being openly gay was socially unacceptable. And this sort of coded symbology and symbol making, which plays out over the course of Indiana's career, begins at its very inception. Indiana was also making diminutive paintings at this time. This is very large scale. These are six feet tall, approximately five or six feet tall. These are one foot by one foot, so don't be thrown off by that. These are very small paintings. And this is the first time love appears in a painting. Oddly, amongst Indiana's early poetic efforts is a poem called When the Word is Love from 1955 that describes the contours of the word's letters. But four-star love here at right is the first appearance of love in paint. Of course, the same compositional elements are circulating amongst other contemporaneous works near to hand. The four orbs become four stars. Four orbs become four stars and similar kinds of things, uh, but love itself is here left and not taken up again until 1964. In 1964, Indiana makes a number of Christmas cards for friends using a technique called frottage in which he draws over stencils placed underneath the paper. This is the first emergence of the stacked four-letter word with a tilted O. The following spring, the Museum of Modern Art invited Indiana to submit designs for a Christmas card for their 1965 season, and he makes three one-foot square love paintings in different color variations, of which this red and white, red and blue one is one. It was a red, blue, and green version that MoMA selected for its card, and there begins love's public dissemination. Love was not conceived as a sculpture until 1966, a work of exact proportions, equally tall and wide, and half as deep. It was first made of solid carved aluminum, and this small work was first shown in the Whitney Museum of American Art's annual exhibition, 1966, Contemporary Sculpture and Printmaking. But already in 1966, Indiana planned to execute the sculpture in different media and in different sizes, colors, and design variations. For Indiana, the love sculpture was more a work of conceptual art that, once designed, might be executed at other times and with other materials, many of which, again, were already defined at that early moment in 66, although it would take decades to realize the full sculptural program. This explains the dating of your love sculpture. It was conceived as the love sculpture in 1966, Yours, which we'll soon see for the first time, and you are not looking at here, was fabricated by artisans at Milgo Bufkin in Brooklyn, New York in 1999. The colors of the Albright Knox's love, the red, blue, and green, are those of the painting MoMA acquired and used for its Christmas card. Indiana associated this color combination with his father, who worked for Philip 66 when Indiana was a child. The Philip 66 sign was red and green, and the specific blue selected was meant to be the cerulean blue of the Indiana sky, against which the Philip 66 sign was a poignant memory of the artist's childhood. The red and blue of the American love are equally specific. The colors accord with the American flag and no other sculptures use these colors. Milwaukee's American love features the colors simply of America. I want now to go back to 1965, just as Indiana goes back and forth, I'm going back and forth. That is how he makes his work. 
I want now to go back to 65 to flesh out another integral aspect of Indiana's work that is not the celebratory red, white, and blue of the 1965 decade auto portrait, which documents his successes in Washington and the move of his home that year, a rather exuberant painting. Another series of work began to take shape in June of 1964, when three men working to register African American voters in Philadelphia, Mississippi, were abducted and murdered. Two months later, their bodies were discovered in an earthen dam. Some months later, on March 7th of 1965, Alabama state troopers and white supremacists brutally attacked marchers who were peacefully protesting and advocating for voting rights in Selma, Alabama, what is now known as Bloody Sunday. This attack provoked outrage across the country and led President Lyndon B. Johnson to advance the legislation that would be signed into law as the Voting Rights Act in August of 1965. Early that summer, the first black police officers in the history of Beloga, Louisiana, were shot from a passing car while on duty. Bogalusa was the city with the highest number of Ku Klux Klan members in the state and a constant flashpoint. An assailant matching the description of the shooter was arrested but never charged for the crime. These horrific events inspired Indiana's Confederacy series which was completed with Florida that same year of 1965, excuse me, 66, the following year. Indiana had intended to add a Georgia painting, but never executed that work. These are very pointed American history paintings in Indiana's personal visual language that document a sad chapter in our nation's history. One does wonder how they speak to us today. One of his largest love paintings in the design called A Love Wall is this 12 foot by 12 foot four panel work from 1968, which is titled Love Rising, Black and White Love for Martin Luther King, completed the year of the civil rights leader's assassination and dedicated to him. Fast forward some 35 years to 2000, and we find Indiana still up to his tricks at his commitments and at his craft. With works such as Remember November and Terror in November, a reference to the very close and disputed presidential election of that year in which George W. Bush triumphed over Al Gore in electoral college votes despite losing the broader popular vote by a narrow margin. He's a very politically engaged artist. And then real terror struck. While Indiana was transiting through New York on the way to an exhibition in France, a remarkable coincidence. In Indiana's life, most things don't seem coincidental. He finds a meaning, a resonance for all of these things. And given how reclusive he was and how infrequently he is traveling, it is remarkable that he is in New York at this moment. He would later recall, I watched the World Trade Center being built and I watched it fall. I was up in Chelsea and I ran all the way down, got around the police barricade and went under the Brooklyn Bridge down to Coenty Slip where my studio used to be, which looked like it had just been hit by a snowstorm. I was eventually rescued and taken uptown by a tugboat. As an additional unbelievable coincidence, he would subsequently learn that a friend from Vinyl Haven had been on American Airlines Flight 11, which was the one crashed into the North Tower. It was in the wake of 9-11 that Indiana boarded up the lower floor windows of the Star of Hope, his Victorian manse on Vinyl Haven, and painted them in this overt display of patriotic sentiment. 
The 9-11 experience immediately brought forth a return to the Confederacy series of 1965 with a painting entitled Afghanistan. In case there's anyone who can't see these slides, it reads, just as in the anatomy of man, every planet must have its hind part, Kabul. However, this rage would soon give way to a series of 24 paintings completed by the summer of 2003 entitled The Peace Paintings. This series harkens back to a series of paintings. As you can imagine, everything moves forwards and backwards. This series harkens back to a series of paintings of the 1960s that also deployed peace imagery and which advocated for brotherhood in a different way in that earlier tumultuous moment. The late peace paintings are indicative of personal commitments Indiana had always had and always held to social justice, to individual rights, and to a world governed by love where the American dream might indeed flourish. I hope you may see now that the American love lies at the very heart of the broad range of Indiana's work and his identity as an artist, as an American, and as a human being. As I said before, it's quite likely Indiana himself considered the American love his most quintessential defining expression of his life as an artist in the public sphere. One may not see this in the simple self-sufficient stacked four-letter form that is among the best-known works of art of the entire 20th century. But as one comes to intimately know the artist and his work, the referential breadth and resonance of the American love achieves its goal. It is a masterpiece with meaningful impact. Indiana wanted to share his love with the whole world for it to be present everywhere. And he would be gratified that love will now be permanently here in Milwaukee. How one embraces it individually, collectively, is up to you. What does American love mean to us, individually and collectively, with respect to one another and the rest of the world today? right now. As I said before, Indiana would urge us to think about these things and to act accordingly. It is up to all of us to define the American love together. Thank you, and I wish you all and each one of you a rich and rewarding relationship with this great American icon for decades to come. Thank you very much.